This is a gym that, like, you have to work. You know, like, there's no wimps in here. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, coming by, and listening. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 298. Today, we're joined by crew John Johnston. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I'm your host on this show. I've got the best job in the world because I get to talk about martial arts. I get to train martial arts as my job. And of course, we do all of this in the effort to share with you some of the products that we make available at whistlekick.com or over at Amazon. Or maybe if you're one of the lucky ones, your school, you have a wholesale account with us and you can pick our stuff up right nearby. We do the show notes for this show at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, which includes photos and social media links to other episodes and guests, other things that we think are relevant that will bring you context for the various episodes because we're just kind of looking to support you as a martial artist on your journey, wherever that is from and to. Because martial arts are great, aren't they? I think so. But then again, I do have, as I've said, the best job in the world. Let's talk about today's episode. I met Crew Johnston last year, uh, 2017, at Master Terry Dow's Martial Arts Symposium in Manchester, New Hampshire. And I was just blown away, not only with this man's passion, but his skill and just the way he approached not only teaching martial arts, but the way he interacted with others. And it, it's a powerful presence, not just because he is a physically imposing man, but he just has this personality that is really difficult to not feel drawn to. I had the chance to see Crew Johnston again this year at the same event, got to watch what he was doing and was just again blown away and said, you know what? I've done the community a disservice not having him on the show prior to now. So of course, reached out to him and I said, please, will you come on the show? Fortunately, he accepted and we're here today. He tells some great stories, some pretty powerful stuff, stuff that you may find insightful, enlightening, and may give you a different approach to your own training. Regardless, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to let him say everything because this is his episode after all. So let's welcome him to the show. Hey, Crew Johnson, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How, how's everything? How are things? I, I just saw you a couple weeks ago. Yep, everything is going great. I'm busy around here, so everything's going awesome. Good, good. Tell me, tell me what you got going on. Uh, we got a whole bunch of stuff going on. We got, um, we got our kids' classes are going crazy. We got um, coming up. This month, we have actually uh, going to be our three-year anniversary, June 22nd. Oh, cool. So we're doing um, an ice bucket challenge. So members are challenging each other to uh, dump a five-gallon bucket of water over their head with ice in it um, <laughs> for ALS. And then we also have um, crazy kickboxing classes going on. It's nuts around here. Nice. But I just from the little bit that I know of you, you strike me as someone who likes when it's crazy. Oh sure. yeah, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I, I like being busy. <laughs> you and me both. That's, that's... Mm -hmm. have you always been that way? Yes. If I'm not active, I'm bored. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's almost, it's a, for me, it's a switch. It's either I am completely bored or I'm completely busy. And it seems like whichever state I'm in, there's a part of me that's asking for the other. You know, I, I struggle to find that. Balance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's a common martial arts thing because you're, I mean, martial arts is never done, right? Like we can just keep doing it and keep finding that's new ways to implement and train and so on. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, at this point that we, we have a, we have a decision to make either. We can just keep talking and kind of let this be, our intro, or if you have questions or anything about, excuse me, about how this is going to go, we can, we can kind of pause, kind of cut it off and no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Well, let's just, let's just keep rolling then. Let the, let the listeners feel like they're getting some behind the scenes stuff. Cause everybody likes that. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, 
you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to to train with you the, the tiniest bit down at Master Dow's at the symposium um, mm-hmm. and, and, and seen you at other things, but I really don't know a ton about your background. So I'd love if you could maybe take us back and tell us how you got started. Um, well, me getting started in the martial arts was not, to, to be honest with you, in the beginning, it wasn't my choice. Um, when I was around 11 years old, um, I grew up in Malden, a uh, city next to Boston. And it was, you know, it was, a, it was kind of the kids I hung out with weren't like the greatest um, kids, but, you know, they were my friends. And I kind of had a little temper you know, with my parents and so forth. And then my parents actually put me into uh, martial arts. They brought me to uh, Master Richard Byrne Tung Soo Do uh, in Malden. And uh, and um, what ended up happening was they were bringing me there for, for discipline. Mm. Uh, and I kind of showed up there. My parents said that we were going to go out one day. And they put me in the car and off we went. And we show up to this karate school and I was like, what are we doing here? And, uh, you know, my parents brought me upstairs and this enormous man comes walking out of an office and it was, you know, Grandmaster Richard Byrne. And, uh, you know, here I am 11 years old, not, not very big, this little twig of a kid. And, um, this huge guy is standing over me and he comes out and he says, uh, he says, hello, I'm Master Richard Byrne. And I said, I'm John. And then, uh, he looked at my parents and he said, okay, you have two choices. You can either stay here and be quiet or you can leave. He's mine for two hours. And, uh, I didn't know from the beginning that, um, they had already spoken to master burn about me. So I thought this was the first time, you know, them meeting him too, but, uh, they had already gone down and spoke to him and, um, set up this plan to have me come in. So, uh, Master Byrne looked at me and he said, all right, are you ready? And I said, yeah, with kind of a little bit of an attitude. And he looked at me and he said, all right, 10 pushups. And I was like, for what? And he said, 20 pushups. And every time I kind of spoke back to him, he kept adding pushups. So I think I got up to about 80 pushups and then I finally did them. And then I stood back up again and he said, all right, now I'm going to ask you again, are you ready? And I was like, yes. And he was like, 10 push-ups. And I was like, why am I having to do push-ups? And he goes, 20 push-ups. He said, after you get done with these push-ups, I'll tell you why. So I did my 20 push-ups. I got up. And he said, okay. He said, "Um, how did I introduce myself? And I said, "Uh, Master Richard Byrne. He said, okay, now put yes in front of that. He said, I'll ask you the question. Are you ready? I said, yes, Master Byrne. He put his armor on me, and that was my start of the martial arts. There's a lot there that we can unpack, but the thing that I'm most interested in <laughs> is, you know, it, it sounds like you remember a lot of details of that moment. So I'm going to guess that you remember Absolutely. a bit of what was going through your head. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. It, I mean, I didn't, in the beginning, when I was there, I was, you know, like I said, I didn't want to, it wasn't my choice. I didn't want to be there. My parents brought me and um, they said, you know, you're doing this. But by the end, by the point, it mm-hmm. just listening to you tell this story now, you know, you're, you're, you're mm-hmm. talking about the attitude in your voice when you started. But when you got to kind of the end of this story where you say, and I said, yes, Master Byrne, your voice leveled a bit. It kind of almost, almost dropped and just kind of mellowed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that only in retrospect or at that moment were you starting – to maybe embrace a little what was happening? Well, I definitely, um, you know, I, I do remember kind of, you know, looking at him and saying, you know, yes, Master Byrne in a way that, you know, out of respect because he, you know, by him kind of making me do, you know, the push-ups and by, um, you know, not, not allowing me to kind of run the show, I think it built more respect. It gained, it gained my respect for him. 
Did your parents choose and to stick around or did they leave? They stayed. Well, my parents got there and they stayed. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm 47 years old. And when, uh, you know, back in the day of the martial arts, it wasn't like it is today. You know, it, back in the day, I mean, I remember Master Byrne coming over and grabbing me, you know, at one point during a class when I was fooling around or when I wasn't paying attention. Um, you know, and he came over and he grabbed me by the back of the neck, you know, and like walk me over and, you know, into a corner and say push ups, you know, and obviously nowadays, if you do that, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's, you're not going to do that <laughs> nowadays. It's not going to happen. There is a risk in doing that today for sure. Right. Definitely. You know, times have, times have definitely changed. And, you know, that was the thing, you know, my parents were sitting there and they were quiet and pretty much whatever happened, happened. Talk to me about what happened as you were training with Master Burn over the next however long you were there. Um, well, in the beginning, I could tell you I did a lot of push-ups, um, you know, because, you know, still, I kind of still had a little bit of, uh, you know, my, my attitude. And, um, you know, and then as time went on, I actually started to embrace the martial arts and I actually started to enjoy, you know, doing it. And, um, you know, it was a traditional martial art. It was Tung Shido. Um, you know, and it, it was, it's funny because, um, about six months into me, uh, doing classes with Master Burn, that's when I met, um, Grandmaster Bill, Bill Wallace. Uh, so over the years, you know, I had trained and, and met, um, Grandmaster Wallace a bunch of times. And then, kind of, you know, as my life went on and I, I stopped doing, um, martial arts at Tung Sudo and I started, you know, went off to college and things of that nature. Um, about five, maybe six years ago, um, at, at, uh, at Master Terry Dow's symposium, I met Bill Wallace again and he remembered me and it was kind of a, it was, it was awesome. You know, so it's kind of like a big circle. You know, things kind of came back. Right. Talk to us about what happened in the meantime in that in that circle, because I'm yeah just from what lot. I've observed, <laughs> Tang Sudo is not mm -hmm. at least your primary art now. No, no, it's not. Um, you know, throughout the years when I came back from college and um, so forth, I I started a I started a business. I started a dog training school back in 1994. And, um, a few years into owning that school, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mark Delagrati came into my school to train his dog. And we started to talk a bit and he told me that he owned a, a Muay Thai school in Somerville, uh, called Sit Ya Tong. And I was like, Oh, you know, I did some, I did some martial arts when I was a kid and we kind of started talking about it and things like that. And he said, Oh, you know, you should come by. And, um, you know, check out the school. And I said, all right. So one day I just, you know, called him up and I said, uh, you know, I want to come by and see the school. He goes, yeah, come on by. I'll introduce you to, uh, one of my other, uh, train and, and see what's going on. So I drove down to Somerville and he introduced me to, uh, crew Eric Armington. And I started to, you know, talk to Eric and I started to talk to, to Mark. And then I just decided that, you know what, I want to start getting back into this. And, uh, I started to do private lessons with crew Eric Armington for Muay Thai. So, you know, I would do two private lessons a week with crew Eric and two privates a week with crew Mark, um, just strictly in Muay Thai. Uh, so doing pad work and, and, you know, stuff like that. I really started to kind of get the, get the itch again. And then back at the time, uh, Kenny Florian, Marcus Davis, Patrick Cote, George Grigel, uh, a bunch of UFC fighters were in the, in the gym and they were training and, you know, me being a, a bigger guy, uh, you know, they would always, they wanted to do some training with me. So we would spar and I started to get the itch even more. So I told crew Eric that I wanted to think, I wanted to see about, about fighting, taking a Muay Thai fight. Um, so I started to do that and then, um, you know, training for fights and so forth. And then 
my first fight was January of 19, no, 2000, 2008, uh, yep, January of 2008 was my, was my, um, first, first fight. And it was a Muay Thai fight. And it was actually at a place called Club Lido in, um, in Revere. And I'll never forget, we're sitting there. I had no idea who I was fighting. Um, I was just sitting there and kind of looking around the room, seeing if I could see any other big guys. And Carreric was sitting next to me. And next thing you know, this guy comes walking in and he literally ducks under the doorway. And I just had this feeling and I'm like, that's the guy I'm fighting. And it was, it, it turned out to be the guy I was fighting. I weighed in at 230 pounds. He weighed in at 254 pounds and he was six foot nine and I'm six foot four. So I was like, okay, I guess this is happening. And I fought and I won by unanimous decision. It went all three rounds and it was a, uh, it was definitely a, a, the toughest fight. It was definitely like, it was a ridiculous fight. I felt like I got hit by a Mack truck, um, for like the next week, but it was, it was tough. And that's kind of how things got started with my, with, you know, in Muay Thai, uh, had a couple more fights in Muay Thai, two more fights in Muay Thai. And, uh, unfortunately crew Eric ended up getting, uh, getting killed by a, mo- on a motorcycle accident. So, you know, and that was a, that was a big heartache, uh, to me. And then it, uh, I started to kind of get the itch to fight some more. And there was no more, like back then lion fights, which is a, uh, a big organization for Muay Thai fights, lion fights wasn't around here. So to find a Muay Thai fight for my, for someone who was my size, it was hard to do. So I switched into doing MMA and then I started doing my Jiu Jitsu wrestling, more boxing, uh, obviously sticking with more Muay Thai. And that's kind of how my career unfolded for that. One of the things you said really struck me, the idea that you, you know, here you've been out of martial arts for a little while. You didn't, you didn't talk about how long, you know, college, you come back, dog training. And then from mm-hmm. a conversation, you're doing four private lessons a week. Most people mm-hmm. don't go from zero to 60 like that with martial arts and, Unless they have a background, unless they really have something either that that there's a goal they're working for or something just kind of clicks. And so here we are with a very different martial art than what you grew up with, but you jumped in with more than both feet. What was it about Muay Thai at that point that just worked for you, that you were so passionate about it from the get-go? Well, I think by, you know, I did um, Tung Shu Do from when I was 11 years old up until I was about 18 years old. You know, so for seven years, I did martial arts. And when I was out of it, for the time that I went to college and so forth, I I definitely missed, you know, I missed it. Um, But when I came back after college, um, going back to Malden wasn't really, I didn't really have the opportunity to do that. So. And then I've always been an active person. I've always been in the gym, you know, lifting weights or, or doing some kind of, some kind of training. Um, so I've always had that, that passion of, of training, of working out. And then when I was able to, you know, meet crew Mark Delagrati and, and crew Eric Armington, um, it just clicked. Like the three of us just clicked right away. You know, and, and, you know, not only did they become my, my, my trainers, my crews, but they also became, you know, close friends of mine. And it was very quickly that it happened. Um, and we, you know, we would hang out even outside of the gym. So I think by me jumping in both feet, you know, even like you said, even more so by doing four privates a week, um, it was one of those things that you know, the passion just hit me right away uh, that I had with the martial arts. And, you know, also the Muay Thai. Muay Thai is a very aggressive style. Um, and I think I like I liked that. I like hitting the pads. I like, you know, kind of the, um, you know, the, the physicality of, of the art. Mm. Um, 
you know, and then seeing guys like Marcus Davis, Patrick Ote, George Brazil, you know, Stephen Bonner, Steve, um, Pete Spratt, you know, guys like this, um, you know, at the gym and, and seeing these guys and the level of, of, uh, you know, the level of physicality and the level of expertise that these guys have. I was just like, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And, you know, it just kind of caused me to work even harder. Right on. We've heard you some know, stories. I, I mean, Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, well, you, um, you go. You. you. <laughs> we might have a tiny <laughs> bit of a delay. Is this is your episode? Yeah. So I'll step back. All right. No worries. You know, and then the other thing is, your tongue. You know, it has a huge name. Um, it's got great, you know, great fighters out of there. Uh, it also has, you know, Kumar Calagrati who. You know, he's done, he's done a, a, a lot, you know, in the, in the martial arts world. Um, so you would think that, you know, this, this gym, this, the, the Sikyatong camp is like this, you know, global gym type of thing. But then when you got there, it was a basement. It was almost like a, it was almost like a Rocky gym, you know, like you're in, you're in Rocky, you know, Rocky three going down, going down to uh, Philadelphia and, and, you know, or not even Philadelphia. Where was um, where was Creed's gym? Um, I forget, but it's kind of like walking into that type of gym. It's like, all right, this is a gym that like you have to work. You know, like there's no wimps in here. So I think when you know, and I have that definitely. I I have that you know, um, I have that I built that mentality of of you know competition. So when I got down there and I saw that. I think that even made me even more wanting what I, wanting the, uh, the, the, the level that these guys were at. We've heard a few stories from you today and I always love hearing stories and, and, you know, I, I felt like I was there as you're sitting there for your first fight and this, this larger man comes through and, and listeners, let me just, just tell you, we, we've, we've heard how tall, crew john is and, and he and he gave us his weight for that that first fight but neither of those really make clear the presence that he has i mean when when you are in a room sir you are the you are the focal point of that room you are you are a big man you have a big personality so for you to describe someone as large um is is rather a powerful statement for to anyone who has met you I'm sure you have other stories though, and I would love to hear one of them. If you, you know, if you had to give a speech in front of a room or something, and you were asked to lead with a story, maybe your favorite story from your time training, what would you tell? Oh man, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess, I guess, you know, it would definitely be um, my for my first MMA fight um my first MMA fight uh was in 2011 and um I was fighting a guy his name was Sandor Binkley now I was 40 years old when I fought for my first professional MMA fight um and crew mark was at first he was against it because he wanted me to continue being a trainer and he wanted me to can, you know, keep training the guys and making sure that, you know, because eventually from me being a student, I was with, I was at Sikitong for 15 years. Um, so Mark, who Mark put me into kind of a trainer, uh, mentality and taught me a lot. And, you know, me now starting to teach fighters and train fighters and do pad work and, things of that nature in Muay Thai, um, it was now my turn that I wanted to fight and I wanted to be the focal point of, you know, the training and things of that nature. So there's a couple of gentlemen, uh, who were my jujitsu instructors. One of them is named Giuliano Coutinho, uh, AKA banana. And then another one is, um, Chris Eldridge, professor Chris Eldridge, who, um, He's a, both of them, both Giuliano Coutinho and, and Chris Eldridge 
are both black belts under Daniel Gracie. Now, there's no, there is no, uh, there was no hiding it. But at the time, my ground game was nil, was very minimal. So when I started MMA, everybody was like, oh, just take John down and, you know, you'll win the fight. Well, I have guys like Chris Eldridge and Giuliano Coutinho um, who are massive men. Now, again, you know, obviously, yes, I'm a, I'm a large guy. But, you know, Giuliano was walking around at probably 270 pounds. Chris Eldridge um, was probably walking around at about 240. Uh, Chris is a uh, world champion arm wrestler, so he is ridiculously strong. And Banana, uh, Giuliano, he is ridiculously strong, and both of them are black belts in jiu-jitsu. And um, they decide that they're going to be my training partners for this fight because they have to, you know, make sure that I don't get taken down. They have to make sure that I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be on the ground. They want me to use my stand up and things of that nature. So for months, um, you know, we, we got this fight and I think I had, I had 12 weeks that I was going to be able to train. So that's about three months, um, that I was going to be able to train for this fight. So the first couple months, it was literally me getting my butt kicked every single day by these two guys put up against the cage, picked up, slammed on the ground, made to get up again, picked up, slammed on the ground again, made to get up again, picked up, slammed on the ground. And I could just keep going on and on and on and on and on. And the night of the fight, um, the, the Sandor comes running after me and tries to grab onto me. And it was almost like in my mind, I did not want to deal with Chris Eldridge or Banana Giuliano Coutinho. I did not want to deal with them. So in my mind, it was like I was fighting against them, not getting to not get slammed on the ground. And every single time Sandor would put his hands on me, it was like it was like he was fire. I would get away from him so fast, and uh, you know it, it definitely resonated into my head that you know these guys put all that work into me. And I was going to, you know, prove, prove that I respected it and prove that, you know, may, and have them be proud of me that, you know, that it, that it did, that their work helped. So, uh, you know, I finished the fight in a minute and 12 seconds, but, uh, you know, I never once got taken down. Never once even was in, in trouble of getting taken down. So, um, right after that fight, crew Mark came up to me and he was very proud of me. And, you know, he basically accepted the fact that, you know, I, okay, let's, let's make a run at this and let's, let's do this for you. So that was a, that was a huge part of my life. What did, what did that mean to you on the other side? Once, you know, it was, it was clear that your preparation had worked well and, and you came out of the fight, obviously in the way that you had hoped to. Um, it, what 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 it meant more to me was not so much as um as just the training, you know, as much as it meant that, you know, I have these guys that care and that, that wanna help me and that, you know, they are eager to drive from you know, they live down the Cape and they're they're coming to, you know, Somerville two to three times a week and, and to just to put the work into me. And, um, you know, it meant the world that these guys would, you know, mean that they, that they, that I meant so much to them that they would do that, you know, and now, you know, I, I definitely call them family and, you know, obviously to this day, we're very much still in touch and, um, we see each other often. I think quite often some of the traditional folks, myself, absolutely included, who have never taken a full contact fight, whether that be mixed martial arts or kickboxing or, or any, you know, even something like a Kyokushin fight. Most of us, most of us listening, most of the guests that we've had have never been in that situation. You grew up with a traditional non full contact background and made that transition into not only that style of training, but that style of competition. Mm -hmm. What might you share with the folks listening about 
what that's like. I mean, we can we can imagine, but I'm always curious of the from the people such as yourself who have not only been in those circumstances but succeeded. Um, you know, it's like I said before. I'm a very uh, I'm a very competitive person, and I and I like to have that competition, and I like to have the odds kind of stacked against me, and just you know. It's one of those things that when you're training, my thought was, yeah, I'm doing all this training, but I want to see if that training actually works. You know, and going into um, my the Muay Thai fights that I had and going into the MMA fights that I had, it wasn't, honestly, it wasn't about me at all. I wasn't, you know, I'm a very humble person. And... I didn't care about the the attention that was brought onto me. I didn't care about, you know, the glamour or the fame or anything like that. What I cared about is that I cared about showing the guys that train with me uh, and that prepare me for these fights that I re- I appreciate it. And I and I went out to all those fights to you know to thank my team, to thank my trainers, to thank my family, to thank my fans, because they're the ones that, you know, they're, they're the ones that give you the, the drive, you know, my son, Evan, um, you know, they're the ones that, that give you the drive to, to go out there and do it. And I'm also, I'm also the type that, you know, like I do, I also, um, I've been in, I've done Krav Maga for many years. And, you know, like you said, some people that have never, you know, competed or never, you know, even taken any kind of full contact, um, full contact match, or even, you know, there are even some people out there who have never been in a street fight who have trained for so many years. I look at it as though, you know, I've trained, but I've also applied it in re- in, in real situations where, you know, I'm in the cage and when you're in the cage, it's just you and the guy, you don't have your friends, you don't have your trainers backing you up, you know, yeah, they're there as support, but they're outside the cage. And now it's time to, for you to either, you know, put up or shut up kind of thing. And when you go out there, you know, win or lose, you want to prove that you have the ability to um, you know, to do the things that you need to do. Are you done with that style of competition? Um, in 2014, um, was my last fight in October of 2014. I, um, I fought seven times in MMA. Uh, I'm seven and oh with, uh, all seven wins by knockout and first round. And I uh, won the heavyweight title for CES back in um, March of 2014. I then fought again in October of 2014 against Keith Bell. Um, and then right after that, uh, I, I kind of said a farewell to the fight game and, you know, decided to go a different route in my life. And um, I still am in the martial arts, but I decided to open up a, a school of my own and, you know, kind of put everything that I know into, you know, into students. Can we talk about that transition for a moment? Do, do you mind? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. No. Nope. So here you are, you're seven and zero, oh, and mm-hmm. if, if I may say you're, you're a little bit older than most of the folks competing in this way at that time. Mm-hmm. A lot older than people competing in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it that way. I'll let you say it that way. Uh huh. What's going through your head? Most people, when they're successful at something, keep pushing. Most people don't stop where they're on top of their game. Mm-hmm. What was going well, through your head that you said, "I'm going to stop doing this undefeated"? Not not just undefeated, but you know, dominant and. Mm-hmm go into teaching others. Right. Well, I mean, 
the the age the age definitely got in the way. Um, you know, one of the problems was that you know I was um, forty four years old, and you know my my body was holding up. I had you know obviously little you know nicks and cuts and bruises and things like that um throughout the years but what kind of came down to it was um we had a little talk with uh you know the higher uh the, the upper level you know ufc and um bellators and things like that and what ended up happening was that my age could have been a factor because in different states you need to have you need to get licensed in different states. So whatever state you're fighting in, you have to get licensed in that state by the commission. So what would happen is is that let's say for instance I had a you know say for instance I got signed by the UFC and I was going to be fighting in you know Colorado or or wherever. I could send in all my medicals and my medicals could be fine, but just because of my age, they may not want to license me. So it was one of those hit or miss types of things. Mm. Um, you know, anytime you see any of the fighters now, for instance, in the UFC that are in their forties, they've been in the UFC for many years. They've been there since they were early thirties, maybe even twenties. Um, and it's kind of like grandfathers. Whereas here I am, 44 years old, um, they're not going to sign a contract with me because who knows how much longer I have left. You know, the, obviously any injuries and so forth that I may obtain might not, might, it might take longer to heal. You know, whereas somebody in their early 30s you know, let's say, for instance, somebody in their early 30s gets an injury, they're out for six or 10 weeks, they're back at it. Somebody in their mid to late 40s gets an injury, they're out for six to 10 months. You know, so it's, it's one of those things that I kind of looked at, you know, and I, and I said to myself, you know, I sat down with my trainers, I sat down with my manager, um, and we all just kind of said, you know what, we made a great run at this. Um, undefeated heavyweight champion. And where am I going to go with this? I'm not going to make it into, I can't make it into a career because at the, at the age that I was, how much longer in that career am I going to make? Or am I going to have? So that's where I just kind of sat down. I said, okay, you know, to better myself, to better my son, to make a, a life for us, you know, a better life for us. And, the direction is to go back into teaching and, you know, open up my own school so that I can pass on everything that I have done and everything that I continue to do to my students now. I would imagine that you, as most people would wonder, what if I had started this sooner? Was Absolutely. There, was there a sense of regret as you looked at that? I mean, is this something that you think about? On days, what would my life be now if I had? Started? I wake up every morning wanting wanting to fight again. Okay. You know, um, the passion is still there. Uh, I was, you know, I I get offers all the time, still, to this day, to you know, to fight again. You know, I got an offer for June 29th to fight a Muay Thai fight. Um, you know, I get. I still talk to, you know, Jimmy Birchfield Jr. and, and um, you know, who runs CES and Pat Sullivan. You know, and at any point in time, if I went back to them and said, hey, I want to fight, they would 100% have a fight for me right away. Um, but I also know that I don't have the time anymore to, to train like I used to before. Um, and I don't have the, you know, I, uh, I don't have, um, 
I, I mean, I still have my trainers and so forth, but I, I don't, I, I can't put in, I can't commit the way that I used to, um, to being able to fight, you know, before when I was fighting, that's all I did. I fought, I taught privates, I taught some classes and that was it. I was in the gym all day, every day. And, you know, I was training for myself. I would train, you know, three times a day, six days a week, just for myself, pad work, strength and conditioning, jujitsu, wrestling, you know, and I would make my schedule around my personal training for my fights. Now, by owning the school that I have, um, and the amount of students that I have, I would never be able to put that type of commitment into, into, uh, training for a fight and you know, myself personally, knowing that I can't do that, I, I, I would feel like I'm cheating myself. One last question on this. I won't keep beating you up on it. How hard is no, it no to, to not take those fights when they're presented? Very hard, <laughs> extremely hard. Uh, you know, I still, my manager, Tyson Chartier, um, I talk to him every single day. You know, he's a very good personal friend of mine. Uh, you know, he was here at my school yesterday. Um, and you know, I talk to him every single day and he just constantly looks at me and he's like, John, there's no reason to, you've done everything. You know, you're, you're undefeated. You're a champion. There's no reason to take a stupid fight just to fight, you know, and, and, you know, it, fighting in, you know, and, and this is what something that people need to understand too. You know, I hope that your, your listeners can understand this. Fighting is not about the money because there is no money in fighting. Unless you're, uh, you know, unless you're at the highest cost, highest level, you know, of the UFC or Bellator where you're one of their, you know, poster childs, there's no money. You know, you have guys in the UFC that are making 12000 to fight and 12000 to win. They're making $24,000. Out of that $24,000, you got to pay taxes. you got to pay your trainers. You have so much stuff to pay that by the time you actually get a paycheck from $24,000, you're probably at about 14000 So for eight or 10 weeks of training, you know, for all that effort and all that, you know, uh, all that, you know, that, uh, that you're putting your, you know, all that time that you had to, to train $14,000. That's what you made. Now is generally fighters have a passion to fight. There's something inside a fighter. Okay. I'll tell you right now, myself included, if you're going to be a fighter, you have a screw loose somewhere in your body. Because getting punched in the face is not, is not comfortable, but there's like an urge to want to do it. There's always that urge to want to do it. And that's the passion of fighting. It has nothing to do with the money at all. It's the desire to want to get in there and, and to fight. So, you know, when my manager Tyson talks to me, he kind of puts me into retrospect and he says, look, John, why do you want to fight just to fight? You want to fight just to fight for what you've done everything that you could possibly have done. You fought when you were 44 years old. That's almost unheard of. You know, actually I was almost, I was 40, almost 45, you know, and that's, that's not normal. That's not, you know, normally you don't see fighters at that age. Fighters are ready, are retired by that age. And I still wanted to do it. How has that experience with, with your fighting, with stepping back when you had nothing left to prove, how has all of that made you a better martial artist and a better teacher to your students? Um, because you can look at it and say, okay, you know what? When someone is at the the highest point that they can go, but there's still one more level, but yet, you know what? It's not reachable, not because of you, but just because of circumstances. 
how can you take that and transfer it to everyone else to show perseverance, to show, to build confidence, to, you know, just kind of have people understand that, look, your life isn't over just because you can't do something anymore. You know, you can make your life better. And that's what I did. I made my life better. So what does your training look like now? You know, you're, you're teaching and I, and you know, I, I've seen well, you I, teaching. I, a, I own, I own, go ahead. I own a school. I own a school called Ironclad Martial Arts Center in uh, Wilmington, Mass. And, you know, we train, we teach kids from the ages of four years old all the way up to adults. And my school is designed around more of a mixed martial arts style. So we teach, uh, we teach Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, and Krav Maga. Uh, I started Krav Maga about 10 years ago with, uh, with a couple of people. Uh, one, one person's name is, is, is Chris Cole. He used to train out of a place called America's Best Defense, owned by Master Paul Garcia. I trained with Master Paul Garcia a few times, and I also trained with another gentleman. His name was Corey Buzzle. Uh, again, same thing out of America's Best Defense. And they are affiliated with um, Alliance Krav Maga, who is a gentleman by the name of John Whitman, who owns that. And I started training with uh, with Corey and with Chris Cole about 10 years ago, showing me, you know, I was doing privates with both of them uh, for Muay Thai and for MMA. Um, I actually trained Chris Cole for, for a bunch of his fights. And then, um, you know, I was interested in learning more about Krav Maga. So that's basically all they did at America's Best Defense was, was Krav Maga. They would do Krav Maga with their adults. So I started to do that. And um, really got into it because of the, I think most mostly because of the aggressiveness of Krav Maga and the practicality of it. So I went ahead and I did a whole a lot of that, a lot of training for that, and then um, I became an affiliate to Alliance Krav Maga. I went ahead and um, and tested under them and got my uh, my certification to uh, be an instructor for Krav Maga. So then I started to implement it here at my school. You know, when I, um, you know, when I decided to open up my school, I wanted, you know, definitely Muay Thai. I wanted to continue the lineage that I had. Um, Jiu Jitsu, because, you know, I, I feel that, uh, you know, like I said a little bit ago in, you know, talking uh, that my ground game wasn't the best, but by you know, doing jujitsu and wrestling and so forth. Obviously I have a ground game now and I think it's very, very, very important for people uh, to have a ground game because, you know, when you look at just self-defense, being able to defend yourself in the street, 90% of the time you're going to end up on the ground. And if that happens, you need to understand how to work on the ground. And I think that's where a lot of, uh, you know, and, and there's nothing, and I always say this, you know, there's, I respect all martial arts and there's nothing against traditional martial arts. Um, you know, like your, your tempos and your taekwondos and things like that. Um, but having a little bit more of a mixed style of understanding, you know, how to be on the ground and how to work on the ground, uh, especially for your, you know, self-defense wise, then, you know, that's a, that's a huge step in, in real life situation is understanding, you know, if I'm on the ground, what do I do? You know, and everybody could say, Oh, well, when you're on the ground, just get up. Okay. Well, if somebody's on top of you, how do you get up? Right. It's hard to get up when you're on the ground, somebody's sitting on you, punching you in the face and you've never been in that situation exactly. before. Exactly. And that's, you know, and that's why it's, it's a, you know, when I opened up my school, um, you know, my, my mentality was, you know what? I want all of my students to be well-rounded, to not only understand the martial arts lifestyle of understanding respect, self-control, self-confidence, perseverance, but to also understand that, 
you know what? If you're standing, this is what you do. If you're on the ground, this is what you do. If you're up against the wall, this is what you do. If you're pinned against the, on the ground, pinned against the wall, this is what you do. And I take my experience of being an MMA fighter. I take my experience from my Krav Maga training. I take my experience from my Muay Thai training. I take my experience from my Jiu Jitsu training and that's all blended together. So my, so not, I teach four year old kids, four year olds, punches, kicks, knees, elbows, um, wall walks, understanding how to get up from the ground if somebody's on top of them. I teach them, um, you know, different self-defense, you know, we do age appropriate self-defense with our kids. So our younger kids, like our four year olds, we don't do a lot of striking with them. You know, we'll do more of control making sure that if they're on the ground, this is how you get up. This is how you control as the, as the kids start to get older, when they go into our next level, which is our karate kids from seven to 11, that's when we start to implement a little bit of striking. Then when, as you know, with our self-defense, then when they get into teens, it's all striking self-defense striking. Then obviously the same thing with our adults. So it's, it's all understood, you know, with our kids, with our adults, Anywhere that you have to be able to defend yourself, anywhere the fight goes, you have the ability to control that fight. And this is how you do it. Mm. One of the subjects that's, that's come up and, and you, you kind of spoke to this almost maybe with a, with a little bit of apology and, and, and I'm going to tell you, you don't need to. One of the subjects that's come up on the show is this idea of diversity of your experience of your training and, you know, we can sit here and, and you put two martial artists in a room and, you know, they're going to argue about what's best. But I don't think anyone disagrees that all is better than any slice of the pie. And the more stuff that you learn and learn with competency, the better you are as a martial artist, especially when it comes to the lens of self-defense. 100%. 100%. You know, I, I remember, you know, back when I was in Kung Shu Do, um, I was at school and this, this boy was doing something to me in school. Um, you know, he was grabbing me a certain way and um, he would always have me against the wall. And I didn't understand, you know, and this is again, when I was like 11 or 12 years old, um, and he wasn't necessarily doing anything he wasn't like fighting me. He wasn't coming after me to fight me, but he would always, you know, do this to me where, you know, it happened a couple times where it frustrated me and I couldn't do anything about it. And I went back to grandmaster burn and I said, you know, this is what's happening to me. I don't know how to defend it. So then he took me off to the side and he said, okay, show me what the kid, show me what the boy's doing. So I showed him and he said, okay, all right, this is what you can do to fix that. And in my mind, I was saying to myself, you know, uh, maybe not necessarily at that time, but definitely now in my mind, I say to myself, why wasn't I learning that in class? Why isn't why am I not learning, you know, those types of different situations in class, you know, and obviously coming from a, from Kung Shu Do, which is a traditional martial art, that type of a, um, technique would not necessarily been taught in a traditional martial art. So I look at it like, you know, nowadays I look at it like, I am going to teach my students everything that could possibly happen to them, or at least, you know, at least 90% of what could possibly happen to them in the street. If somebody comes up and grabs you like this, if somebody comes up and bear hugs you, if somebody comes up and you grabs you by the back of the head, if somebody is, you know, choking you and slams you up against the wall, if somebody is trying to take you down, if somebody has you pinned up against the wall and you're on the ground, if somebody has you on top of you is in mount position and is sitting over you punching, if somebody's in side control, if somebody's in, you know, there's thousands of different positions that you can, you can be put into, but how many styles, 
how many individual styles. Okay, if I look at Taekwondo as an individual style, if I look at Muay Thai as an individual style, if I look at Kempo as an individual style, there's not one style that trains all of that. So what we have to start doing, and, and you know, like you said, understanding many different styles, I feel now coming out of the, coming uh, through the, the kind of the background that I've had, I'm a more complete martial artist. I feel that I'm more of a complete martial artist. Not only have I under, have I learned the traditional style with my side kicks, my spinning back kicks, my hook kicks, my my spinning hook kicks, my jump front kicks, you know, um, my different katas and things of that nature. But I've also gone into a Muay Thai, which is a very aggressive style. Punches, kicks, knees, elbows, tie clinches, trips, understanding how, you know, my different ranges of punches, where I can punch, where I can kick, where I can knee. Not only that, but show, but doing leg kicks, kicking below the belt, not just above the belt, not just to the body, not just to the head, but to the legs. Then on top of that, the jujitsu that I've gone through, the, the cage work and the wrestling that I've gone through by doing all of that and putting that all together. And now, you know, what I consider, um, our style of martial arts that we teach here at Ironclad. Now I'm going to make my students much more of an all around, you know, all around fighter and be able to control situations a lot easier. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that that's the best thing in the world, but I look at it like, you know what, I'm going to make sure that my students are safe and they're going to understand every area that could possibly happen to them. And I look at it this way. If I was a, if my job was as a, a scientist, if I was a biology researcher, I'm still going to be using math and writing and chemistry every day, even though mm -hmm. my focus Correct. is biology. So without those other pieces, I can't take my focus nearly as far. I mean, how well can you really understand biology if, if you don't understand the other, these other interrelated Subject. There's a reason that if you, you know, major in pre med, you have to take things like organic chemistry and in various math classes because mm -hmm. it's required for understanding what it is you're going to do and you know whatever your primary martial art is. Understanding even even if your your art is purely, let's say, a stand up art, understanding how someone may try to take you to the ground is still going to make you a better taekwondo practitioner because you Absolutely. know how the body moves. Mm hmm 100%. All right. So tell us a little bit more about what you see in the future for you, for your school, for your students. What What's getting you up every day now? You know, you you always seem like you're fired up. So what is it, you know, is there a carrot? Yeah, is there something you're driving for? I mean, I'm honestly, I, I drive for my students. Um, You know, coming into my school every day, and just excited to teach, excited for, for my students. Um, you know, I'm still in the fight game. I still train um, Rob Font and Calvin Cater, who are both fighters in the UFC. Um, I'm, their, I'm their striking coach. And, you know, I train with them. My, Rob, I train, I train with them every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three days a week. You know, Rob has a fight coming up uh, in, on July 7th in Las Vegas. Uh, huge fight. He's ranked number 12 right now. He's going to be fighting the number three ranked, um, you know, in bantamweight, he's a 135 er So that's a huge fight for us, for him. And it's, and, you know, I'm still in the game with that, but I'm more, but I'm a trainer, you know, getting these guys ready for their fights and they're in the highest level possible. They're up in the UFC. Um, but coming in and just getting my students, you know, my, I love seeing my, my students progress. You know, I love seeing that in the beginning of the month when I'm teaching them a new technique and things are kind of hectic, things are kind of crazy. You know, you're looking at it and you're going, Oh my God, I don't know if these kids are ever going to get it. And then by, you know, like the third week they're doing that technique, like they've been doing it for years. You know, that just, that really fires me up and it, and it gives me even more drive and more desire, you know, to want to, to want to teach these kids more of what I know. And it, and it's kind of hard because 
you know, when I'm in class, I always, I'm like, all right, you know, this month we're going to do this, this, and this. And then I'm in class and I'm like, oh man, I want to teach him this one now. I want to teach him this one now. And it's like, I always want to teach something else, something else, something else, something else. Because, you know, I look at it like I have gone through so much in my life in the martial arts, so many different styles, so many different, you know, I've worked with so many awesome trainers, you know, like everyone that I've worked with, I have, I have taken a piece of their pie and I want to put that on to my students. You know, I want to put that on to my son, you know, my son, Evan, he's, he's 12 years old. Uh, he's a goalie for hockey. He plays lacrosse, you know, he loves his sports, but you know, when he comes up to me and he says, Hey guy, can we do some pad work? I love it. You know, it's the, the, the drive for me comes from them, comes from my students, comes from my son. And, uh, you know, I love going out and, and teaching seminars because I, I love to, to pass on my knowledge and, and, you know, what I've done in my life to, to other people and to, you know, show them, look, you know, this, this style right here would be great for, for this situation or, you know, or maybe implement this into your style a little bit. You know, I look at, I look at everything as a, as a toolbox. Um, you know, in my life, the trainers that I've had the opportunity to train with, um, they're all world-class trainers. And I've been lucky enough, lucky enough to do that. I, I, I look at my, myself as a person having two different toolboxes, you know, and one toolbox has kind of like my go-tos. These are my go-to techniques. You know, these techniques I've worked on, I feel comfortable with, and these are the ones that I'm always going to use. Then I have my second toolbox, which, you know, for instance, you know, Grandmaster Superfoot Wallace, Bill Wallace, you know, he has shown me so many things. Um, you know, and I've, and I was lucky enough that I, I was able to test under him and receive my black belt under him. And, uh, you know, he has shown me so many things, but being a bigger guy, there's a couple techniques that he has shown me that I still have to work on. So they get put in my second toolbox. These are my work on, this is my work on toolbox. Um, and when I start to get a little bit more fluent and start to, uh, you know, use those without thinking about them. Then they go into my go-to toolbox. Then I have a trash barrel. And that trash barrel is somebody shows me a technique. I try it a couple times and I look at it and go, you know what? That would work for maybe a 180 pound guy, but it's not going to work for me. And I throw that in the trash because I've tried it. I've tried it. I've tried it. And it's either, I don't understand it. My body just won't do it because I'll be the first one to tell you that I'm not very flexible. Um, you know, so if you're trying to, to make me do something that I have to use a lot of flexibility, it's going to go right into the trash. Um, you know, but by doing that, you know, I, I take all this, that I, that all my knowledge and all my toolbox stuff, and I want to present that to my students and my students give me more drive to go out there and learn more so that I can come back and teach them. Awesome. And if any of the folks listening want to reach you, if they want to, you know, check out Ironclad, find you online, social media, all that, how would they do so? Yeah, I mean, we have our website, uh, ironcladmartialarts.com. You can also uh, look us up on Facebook under Ironclad Martial Arts. We're on Instagram at Ironclad Martial Arts. Um, or you know what? You can even just email us, ironcladmartialarts at gmail.com. Uh, you know, I'm always eager to, to help people out and to, you know, teach people. And, you know, if they have the desire to want to learn, I'll have the desire to want to teach. Perfect. And of course, if anybody new out there is listening, we do drop links and all this over at the show notes, whistlekick, martial arts, radio.com. So you don't have to worry about scribbling down notes while you're driving or on the treadmill or something. I really thank you for being here. This has been a lot of fun. Great, great stories. And I'm wondering if you might send us out with some parting words for everyone listening. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, uh, the one thing that I always say is that, uh, you know, the only one that can beat you is you. 
So, if, you know, if you go out there and, and you, you're you trying something and you're, you know, you're letting your mentality be negative or you're kind of saying to yourself, well, oh, you know, I don't know if I could do this. You know, the only one that could beat you is you. So the first, the first moment of negativity that you put in your head, you've already beat yourself, you know? So go out there and, um, you know, it's, I always say when I first wake up in the morning and I look at the mirror, I never say I'm tired. I always say today is going to be a better day than yesterday. When we talk about martial arts, we're often, even if it's not intentional, using language to draw divisions. I am this style of karate, or I am, I am this. I've trained in this and this under this person. And while those can be identifying and they can give context, they can also put up barriers. And one of the things that I found really powerful about Crew Johnston's words is that he talks about his history, his context for the martial arts, his views, but I don't get the sense that he's putting up any of these barriers. He's working with what he works with because he believes it works, yet I suspect if somebody came out of left field, showed him new things that completely upended his views of the martial arts, I have no doubt he would accept taking those in and trying them out. And as he said, deciding which toolbox or trash can they're going to go in. Thank you, Crew Johnson, for coming on the show. I had a great time, and I'm sure all of the listeners enjoyed everything that you said. If you want to check out the show notes, you can do so at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got some photos. We've got some links. You can check out Ironclad Martial Arts on social media. And I hope you do. If you're ever in the New England area, definitely drop by the school. You know, you should message first. But here's someone who can give you some exceptional training. That is for sure. If you want to check out our Whistlekick products, we've got new stuff coming all the time. And I say that, and I don't think all of you believe it, but we are constantly rolling out new things. A lot of great apparel that it's just fun. You know, we, we try to keep our prices low or we don't make a lot of money on our apparel. To be honest, we sell the apparel in the hope that you'll wear it around. People will see it and say, oh, Whistlekick. And then maybe they'll go buy some of the other stuff. We make a little bit of money on our accessories, our training equipment. The apparel is really just a hope to break even and hope that you'll do a little bit of uh, quote-unquote advertising for us. That's all I've got for today. If you want to reach out, you can. Social media, we're at Whistlekick. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Let me know, who should we interview? Who do you know that I should have a conversation with? Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.